Chapter 10. The Tragic Death of Ashley Fox The audience's attention was directed toward the platforms as the final event was announced. Tonight, in an encore exhibition grudge match, we have Miss Ashley Fox standing 5 foot 7, weighing 120 pounds. This is Miss Fox's first fight. She'll be going up against a champion who has not graced the ring in some weeks, a towering 6 foot 4, weighing in at 317 pounds, with an outstanding, undisputed record of 28 wins. The one, the only Moses Modred Mohammed. Bell rang, and the fighters were directed to the apron. Ash saw Jeffrey in the front row. Sky's arms were around him. The rest of Ashley's friends were gathered behind them. Mo walked down into the pit as Ash was shoved over the lip. She slid smoothly down the steep banked floor. Mo walked toward her with no hint of aggression or malice in his steps. Ash waited, and he stopped just out of arm's reach. Interested in ending this peacefully? Mo asked. How's that? Be my girl. Come work for me. I don't think so. Don't be stupid now. She smiled. Are you calling me stupid? That's cute. Mo paused to give her time to think it over. He looked around the packed auditorium and back to the frail girl standing before him. The brief moment didn't seem to have changed her mind. Look, I get it. So maybe it's not your fault. Let's work something out. I don't want to hurt you. But you're making me look stupid here. Ashley didn't know how to respond. She couldn't give in. She lifted her glittering hands for Mo, letting him get a good look. He leaned forward, confused by the nature of the tiny specks of glass on Ashley's gauze-wrapped hands. The camera zoomed in and got a good look, too. The big screen displayed the shards of mirrored glass coating her wrapped fists. Ashley snapped her loose hands into fists and tiny shards shot into the air between them. Mo shielded his eyes as he ducked, but it took him several seconds to wipe the razor's sharp specks from his hands and face. Finally, he approached her again. Ashley kept her hands up in a loose fighting stance. Your funeral. Impossibly fast, Mo reached out and grabbed Ashley's right wrist. He backhanded her across the face, literally knocking her senseless. She hung from his grip like a rag doll. The bleachers, the entire auditorium, went silent. Mo's next strike went to her solar plexus and lifted her body into the air. He released her wrist and let her fall to the cold metal floor. Ashley struggled to her hands and knees. Mo kicked her in the ribs, rolling her across the pit. I guess we just gotta tenderize the meat a bit first. He kicked at her again, but Ash scrambled away and made it to her feet. Mo waited. Ashley took a few deep breaths, but the fury in her eyes told him she was not ready to give up. Not yet, anyhow. Mo charged at her, moving faster than she believed he could. He swung with an uppercut designed to rip her head off. As she shifted her posture, the massive paw whistled past her chin and cheekbone, but didn't connect. Fully committed, Mo's strike slowed as it reached the top of its arc. If he had hit her, he might have killed her, but now she'd found his soft inside. Mo had put everything into the strike. He'd need a moment to recover his posture. He was stuck. Ashley jabbed with her right hand. Her mirrored knuckles shredded their way across Mo's eyebrow and forehead. He stepped back and ran a hand across his brow. It came away wet with blood and glittering mirror fragments. Mo stepped in, swinging and missing with another backhand. Having found his speed, Ash slid past him easily. She drove splinter-coated knuckles into his throat, followed by a shattering right to his mouth. Mo spit wet shards of mirror onto the floor. His face was covered with blood. Unable to risk a deep breath, he first exhaled forcefully, spraying blood and glass everywhere. Ash heard the tiny shards ping against the metal floor. Able to breathe again, Mo growled and charged. As he lunged for her, Ash executed an improved version of the move she'd just seen Macho Man do. She went up the ramp, spun, and planted a solid right fist against Mo's ear. The punch was strong, with lots of momentum, and it scrambled Mo's circuits, leaving him dangerously off balance. He stumbled to a knee. Ash delivered a well-placed kick to his head, followed by another right hand to his eye. As she took a position in front of him and unloaded on Mo's face, she hit him a dozen times before he grabbed her hip and pushed her away. Mo stood. He was effectively blind, his face a mass of bloody tissue. Ashley came forward with a kick, but he caught it and grabbed her by the waist. He lifted her from her feet and slammed her to the ground. He didn't release her, but instead lifted her several more times, smashing the small girl to the hard metal floor. Through one small area of vision, 
Mo looked for the grate and shifted her battered body toward it. Ash struggled, getting an elbow into his face, but he was far too angry for it to have any effect. The circular grate at the center of the pit was composed of two-inch intersecting metal bars and held closed by a pressure-sensitive switch. Beyond it, there was nothing but empty sky for 12,000 feet. Mo lifted Ash and hurled her onto the grate. She landed right in the center of it, but miraculously the switch didn't pop. Going with her momentum, she rolled off to the other side, landing on her feet. Mo was standing directly opposite. They glared at each other. The crowd went wild. A second too late, the great latch popped. It didn't fall open. It just dropped a foot or so, and registering the lack of any weight, automatically reset itself. Ashley and Mo never took their eyes off each other. The crowd was screaming madly. Then the weapons began to rain in around them, the metallic clatter bolstering their applause. Mo wiped the blood from his face. His left eye was swollen shut, and his right offered only a thin sliver of vision. A massive bowie knife slid to a stop at his feet. He picked it up. Ash didn't move toward any of the weapons scattered about. She discreetly fished the surgical knife from her back pocket and flipped the plastic safety cap from its tip. The blade was no bigger than her thumb. Ashley and Moe both walked away from the grate, facing each other across the weapon-strewn, blood-stained, white metal floor. Moe rushed toward her, slashing with the blade. Ash dodged the big knife and found the inside of his elbow with her scalpel, severing the tendons between his forearm and bicep. Mo grabbed her upper thigh with his left, but attempting to stab her with his right, he discovered the damage she had done to his elbow. Ash then hit the knot of muscle at his shoulder and chest with her blade, weakening his grasp on her leg, but he didn't let go. Ash moved the scalpel in a blinding fury and lacerated him half a dozen times, but obstructed by the massive arm, Ashley failed to reach any key arteries or tendons, inflicting only surface damage. Mo summoned all his strength. He lifted, spun, and hurled Ashley again toward the center of the pit. With her final strike, Ashley reached out and slashed at Moe's neck, but as she sailed away from him, the blade only grazed his cheekbone. She sliced him from ear to mouth, but missed his carotid artery by several inches, and then she was airborne. The grate was under her and she was going to land on it. She watched the scalpel float away as she angled to catch the bars. Her feet came down first, her left made solid contact in an intersection between a bar and crossbar, her right foot slipped, missed the crossbar and dropped between them. Her hands made contact and closed. The full weight of her landing hit the grate. The latch popped. Ashley felt the grate give and grabbed the bars with all she had. Her right leg wrapped and tucked around the crossbar. The grate dropped, spinning her out over the empty sky. She vanished from the auditorium like a cheap magic trick. Her scalpel clattered to the floor behind her. Mo remained a motionless ball of bloody meat on the pit's white painted surface, bleeding toward the gaping hole in the center. Situated on the western edge of the city, the infamous bar known only as Docks floated less than two miles from the international border over the Pacific Ocean. The rundown structure hovered at anchor along the north-south flyways, just over the border. Angel City had become the last outpost of the Wild West. Over international waters, no taxes could be excised and no laws could be enforced. The lure of international airspace infected the atmosphere with lazy exuberance. There was plenty of money to be made, but hurrying attracted attention, and those profiting over the border's blurry lines preferred their business remain private. The numerous establishments all offered similar services, and just like anywhere, location was key. The building pilots would jockey for position to catch the drifting traffic that descended from the gravity cables to the east. The architectural flotsam drifted up, down, north, south, east, west, and across the border with casual nonchalance. The municipal authorities weren't about to enforce federal regulations, not when the lure of high seas was half the draw of Angel City. Of course, the entertainment industry was still important, but they also had the busiest ports on the continent. Some would argue that's all it really was. It's a port city in the middle of nowhere. Judging by the vehicles tethered to the parking lot, docks generally pandered to road trash. The twin antenna-style parking structures were full, and several patrons had anchored at the nearby pay lot, which offered vehicle security and a shuttle to Doc's gangplanks. The overhead signs simply read, Bar. The place overflowed with low-life drifters, con men, thieves, and cutthroats of all distinction. The mortician and chief security officer for District 13 sat at the bar. A great collection of empty bottles stood abandoned before them. We pulled in Dunkirk's witness the other day, Morgan Stern said. 
Franklin Gustav Morgenstern was a giant. He stood almost seven feet tall and weighed close to 400 pounds. A veteran of three wars, he'd served in two of those with the man to his left. Disgraced by scandal and forced to resign, Colonel Keller was now serving as 13's warden. With them, on the other side of Keller, was another man, wide, loud, given to fits of violence. They knew him only as the Texan. Dunkirk's witness, is that so? Keller could have cared less, despite the fact that the infamous serial killer had once been the unit surgeon in his former command. Morgenstern pointed to the screen. That's her. Colonel Keller looked up at the monitor. On screen, Ashley was being introduced as the challenger against Moe. That's 13, isn't it? Keller asked. It is, Morgenstern replied. Keller waved to the bartender. Turn it up, he ordered. The bartender scowled but triggered the remote, raising the volume. And clear away some of these bottles, huh? The barman scowled again, but he collected the glass and moved to the other end of the bar. Morgenstern's eyes were glued to the screen. I've seen her before. Really? Keller asked, and looked back up at the data stream. She's Dunkirk's witness, you know, Morgenstern said. Yeah, you said that. Keller took a swig from his bottle. The Texan watched the screen, apparently not paying any attention to their conversation. She came in two days ago. She came in late, Morgenstern said. <laughs> no papers? Keller laughed. Lost in the shuffle, Morgenstern answered. The vid screen displayed a close-up of Ashley after her first solid hit to Moe's face. If she's bait, I'll clean that hook, Keller said. Morgenstern wasn't listening. The battle-scarred giant looked pale, haunted. Keller had never seen him like that. What's up with you tonight? he asked. Morgenstern took a deep breath and focused. I used to have this dream, this nightmare. It was a long time ago. That's where I've seen her. She was younger in my dream. Younger. Keller looked at Morgenstern, surprised to hear the death doctor express something as intimate as having nightmares. He'd known this man for almost 20 years. They had killed together, on and off the clock. The Texan looked over as well. Are you serious? You had nightmares? You fucking pansy. Keller laughed. Just one. But if I had it once, I had it a hundred times. Every night for months. It starts out, I'm flying, and it's pitch black. I can smell the air. I can hear the wind around me. I can hear the water and smell the ocean. I'm flying over the water. I see my reflection. I'm a dragon, exhaling fire. I see the land up ahead. A cliffside resort town with shops along a cobblestone walkway. I head for a bluff overlooking the water. It's a narrow strip of manicured park with little trees and paths separating the perfect village from the cliff's edge. It's beginning to get light, almost dawn. As I touch down, I realize I'm not a dragon anymore, just myself. I stand in the grass. A wooden fence stands between the park and me. As I step toward it, I feel the blades of grass crushed, broken and splintered under my boots. It's cold out and they break like glass. The sharp tread of my boots shatter them and shred them into green bleeding splinters. I can hear it happening, almost like I hear them screaming. I look down and I see them bleeding green blood, the grass, and I see the morning dew. Wet on the leather tops of my boots, I look up, I look around, I see no one. I jump over the quaint wooden fence and then I see her. She's 10 or 12 years old, standing maybe 20 feet away. Same long dark hair. Same blue eyes, same face, wearing a blue and white dress. I notice her hands are behind her back, and she smiles like a viper. And that smile scares me to death every time. I try and smile back, and she snarls. Her ears talk, and she's moving toward me like an animal. She holds a sword, and it's on fire. She's running toward me. Morgenstern watched Ashley's televised fight. Everyone watched the fight. Mo held her down battering her arms and head. Then what? The Texan asked. What then what? Morgenstern replied. She slices me in half is then what? My head and shoulders fall away from my torso. I see her look at me. She sets the tip of her burning sore between my eyes and pushes. I feel it. The burning metal blisters my skin. Sometimes I would wake up and I swear I could smell my own brain sizzling. The bar sat quiet and still. Everyone watched the fight with diamond-tipped focus, desperate not to turn and look at Morgenstern. The tide had turned. Ashley was winning. But then Moe heaved her onto the grate, and she vanished. 
Morgenstern blinked and shook his head before slamming his beer. On screen they played replays. The girl had been thrown out the grate. What do you say we go slash up a couple whores later? That usually cheers you up, Keller offered. Morgenstern took a deep breath. Maybe some Russian roulette, and I hope I lose. Keller smiled. Now you're talking. Clear your head out a little. The three of them burst into laughter. Disturbed, the bartender stepped away. Chapter 11 Look, Mom, no hands. Mo struggled to his knees and failed to keep his hands over the deepest points where Ashley had slashed him. He was losing a lot of blood. He watched it run down the sloped floor and toward the yawning hole. The grate remained open. The camera feed mounted over the grate exposed the gaping maw of the recycling pit. The grate could not be seen, the hinge swinging it all the way under the opening. The announcer gestured for the emergency crew to see to Mo, who hardly noticed as they went to work on him. He appeared dazed, captivated by the rivulets of blood on their way toward the grate. The crimson liquid found no obstacles as it ran toward the pit's hungry mouth and poured out into the Southern California sky, several thousand feet above sea level. Before the blood fell fifty feet, it vanished. Didn't seem to fall as much as glide away into the evening sky. Ashley hung upside down from the grate, hooked by one leg, her arms swinging free. The grate was designed to actually drop a foot before the hinge caught. The violent impact had ripped it from Ashley's grip. Her hands had been jerked from the oil metal when the grate opened. The foot that missed the crossbar had wrapped and hooked around the bars. The bar-wrapped leg saved her life. Hanging there, she watched the crimson liquid glide away beneath her. Ash discovered she was strangely calm, relaxed, enjoying her inverted siesta outside the chaos that had become her new life. Ash heard the mechanics of the grate resetting itself and preparing to close. It twitched upward and Ashley did an easy sit-up, grabbing hold with both hands. The motor engaged and slowly brought the grate back into view. On the overhead camera, the lights of the auditorium illuminated Ashley, crouched on the metal bars. The spectators noticed and immediately began yelling and screaming. As the grate brought her level and closed, Ash rolled off, safe now on the metal floor of the pit. The grate snapped shut and locked. Ashley stood. The audience erupted into frenzied cheers and laughter. Mo sat on the wheeled stretcher, battered and stunned. Ash saw her scalpel lying near her feet, and she picked it up. She walked around the pit toward Mo. The scalpel gripped with a purpose. The EMTs backed away. Hey, bitch. Lethal stood on the apron. The crowd fell silent. He was holding a Japanese short sword. Ash faced him as he stepped out and slid down into the shallow pit. Couldn't find a real sword, she asked. For that, I'd need a real challenge, Lethal answered. Yeah, well, Ashley held up the scalpel. Lethal attacked. He was much faster, more accurate, and far more dangerous than Mo. They danced around the pit floor, trading strikes and parries with mechanical precision. Ashley saw no weakness, took all her attention to survive. She almost gave up hope, fearing he might score a debilitating hit. She knew it could happen at any moment, and then, suddenly, it was there. She saw a soft spot. She moved into the opening and caught Lethal at the wrist with her blade. He jerked back as if burned. Ash stood straighter. She leisurely stretched and rolled her neck. The crowd got quiet. One of the cameras spotted the tiny stream of blood that ran from Lethal's wrist, zooming in and magnifying the wound, multiplying it on all the hanging screens. Ashley reversed the grip on her scalpel, holding it upside down, the blade protruding from the base of her hand. Lethal launched toward her. His feet seemed to float above the ground. He slashed at her. She was ready and countered opening a long red stripe down his ribs. Lethal looked at the wound, stumbled backward in shock and took a moment to regain his composure. He too inverted his grip, spinning the Kodachi in his hand. Ashley let her guard down and backed away. Lethal charged her again. She ducked his blade as her scalpel found his throat. A few steps past her, he stopped. He raised his hand to his neck and touched. His fingers came away clean. He held his clean hand out before his face, confused. Then his life's blood burst from his neck in a successive rhythmic spray, each weaker than the last. The whole of his hand was now painted bright red. Lethal fell to the ground, his eyes open, but unseeing. Ash stood near the center of the pit, covered in blood and bruises. 
The auditorium had been relatively silent since Lethal shouted at her, and no one spoke now either. Ashley turned and climbed the steep sides of the pit. Walking at an angle, her shoes barely held the painted and blood-slick sides. When she reached the top, the auditorium exploded with thunderous applause. Ash took a couple deep breaths. Jeff was there, smiling with all the other kids, her new friends. The MTs gestured for her to raise her arms in the air so they could inspect her wounds. She did, the official gesture of victory. The kids only shouted, screamed, and cheered louder. The medical techs looked her over. They dabbed her cuts with antibiotics. They cut away her mirrored gloves, then cleaned and bandaged her hands. They checked her face, dabbing on blue goo here and there. They checked her pupils, her heart rate, the inside of her mouth. Finished, they backed away, clearing her. Sky, Jeff, Kaz, Hambone, and Tanaka, accompanied by Jones, Big Chris, Oddball, Lee, Rudy, Taylor, and lots of kids she'd never met, all stood cheering for her. Jeff ran forward and hugged her, and she hugged him back. Sky stepped forward and offered her shoulder for support. Ash undoubtedly would have fallen if Sky hadn't caught her. Ash didn't smile, but no one else seemed to notice. Ash held on to Sky, letting her lead them from the madhouse. Dante sat in a center box seat, hunched forward, elbows on knees, fists at his mouth, his nose red and swollen beneath the butterfly bandage. Part 2. On Killing Prologue. The Birth of Dante Magnus Three hours later, Dante still sat, forgotten in the darkened waste shoot auditorium. He had a lot to think about. He'd just seen Moe and Lethal beaten stupid by a girl. Hell, Lee was dead. That left him in command of the devils. That left him to deal with this Ashley, and by his calculations, over 30 other individuals who would try and kill him for control of the district. Dante knew that if he didn't handle the Ashley problem, and at the same time confront the other significant threats, he would be dead in less than 48 hours. In the distance, a couple janitors appeared. The short, weasel-faced one in glasses was Nelson, followed by a taller man. Dante didn't recognize him, tall with a full head of graying hair. Dante had no way of knowing, but he was the same fellow Ash had seen in the hallway, after she killed Donovan. Chapter 12. The King of Pirate Island The next morning, Ashley woke at dawn. The recovery ward was relatively open and quiet. Sky, Kaz, and dozens of other kids slept sprawled on every available chair or bed. A few had even crashed on the floor. Ashley remembered how the techs had insisted on checking her out in the ward. She'd stayed with them and so had the underdog victory celebration. The techs were forced to stitch her up under raucous conditions, but their only instruction for the patient was to take it easy and stay awake for a couple hours to avoid a coma. Hambone had reasoned that the company would help her stay awake, and ingesting and or spilling alcohol would serve as a disinfectant slash painkiller. Sky too, insisted the victory celebration stay in the recovery ward. The place looked like a frat house after finals. Empty bottles and cups were stacked anywhere that there weren't sleeping kids. Ash looked over to Jeff and Sky. Movement caught her attention. Across the room, a tall man in a white lab coat stood with his back to her. He was pulling supplies from a cabinet. He closed it and turned to look directly at her. Morgenstern kept his features blank as he made eye contact with the young girl. Likewise, Ashley didn't react with either a smile or a frown. Closing the cabinet, he turned and walked out. A few minutes later, Jeffrey woke and saw his sister. Hey, Ash. Hey, kiddo, she replied. Jeff smiled. Ash struggled to get out of bed. Her entire body ached. Her forearms were in so much pain it hurt to use her hands. When her legs took up her weight, they screamed in protest. She limped over to Jeff's bed. Are you okay? She asked, brushing his hair back from his forehead. I'm okay, he answered. How are you? I'm okay, she replied, smiling. Ash looked around the crowded room. She gestured to the sliding doors of an outdoor patio. Want to go outside? She asked. Sure, he answered. Ash and Jeff slipped out of the crowded ICU and out onto the patio. They leaned against the railing as the sky gradually filled with light. Did you fight them to get my shirt back? Jeff asked. No, they took your shirt and pushed you down those stairs because of something I did. What? he asked. Still groggy with sleep, Sky stepped out onto the patio. Hey, you two. Hey, Sky, Jeff answered. 
Ash smiled, glad to see that they had become friends. Jeff, Lethal knew you were my brother. He took your shirt because I beat up a friend of his who was hurting Skye. What happened? Jeff asked Skye directly. Skye took a deep breath. This guy, Carver, he was pushing me around and... Ashley broke his neck. Broke his neck? Jeff asked his sister, astonished. I didn't mean to, Ash offered. Yes, you did, Sky said, and I'm glad. He was an asshole. You broke his neck? Jeff asked again. She kicked him and his whole damn head spun around backwards. What? Hambone stepped out on the patio and lit a cigarette. He was clearly not awake yet and suffering from a hangover. He stood at the railing smoking and coughing, but otherwise ignoring Ashley, Sky, and Jeff. Sky watched him for a moment and then turned back to the stunned Jeffrey. Get this, he's still alive and now his head is stuck on backwards. She pantomimed Frankenstein, but looked over her shoulder as if her head were twisted around. Jeff and Sky laughed. Even Hambone smiled. The doctors don't know what to do, Sky laughed. Jeffrey cracked up. Sky grinned at Ash, who smiled in spite of herself and rolled her eyes. Did you just roll your eyes? Don't roll your eyes. I'm not making this up. I couldn't if I wanted to, and no one would believe me. Her voice had taken on a new seriousness. She turned back to Jeff. So Carver's buddy, this little weasel Otai, he goes and gets a bigger kid, Marco, to try and beat up on Ash. This idiot comes by and tries to hassle her. Man, she broke him into six little pieces. They're fighting, she's doing all right, so he pulls a knife. She took it away from him, broke his arm, and made him apologize. Sky knelt to look Jeff in the eye. Tell me, do they call her Grasshopper? Grass a who? Jeff asked. Sky stood up. Is she some top secret ninja warrior or what? What do you mean? Jeff smiled, well aware of his sister's prohibition against telling anyone about her training with Sifu Pan. Sky continued. Maybe an ultra fighter from the Cosmic Rift, sent here to protect us from assholes and bullies and whatever. Come on, Ash, what's your secret word? Okay, wait, this I know for sure. Ash is not an ultra fighter from the Cosmic Rift. I watched that show. He surreptitiously turned to his sister. You're not an ultra fighter, are you, Ash? Ash tilted her head and raised an eyebrow. But she laughed a little, and it hurt her face to smile. Because if you were, I'd catch you in your uniform once in a while and think you were just a crazy fan. But I never caught you in your uniform, not even once. That's just because I'm good. Ashley smiled, taunting her little brother. Sky and Hambone both burst into laughter. Hambone leaned forward and interrupted with his cigarette. Shit, the way you put down Lethal and Moe, you are the top dog now. Whatever, Ash said, disturbed by his interruption. Yeah, right, whatever, Hambone answered. Sky and Jeff stayed quiet. What's your deal? Ash asked, confronting him. What, me? Nothing. But let me just say this. There are a dozen hyenas here all waiting to take Moe's place, and a dozen lethals all dying to earn their rep. A rep they're going to earn on your ass. Hambone took a drag from his smoke. The devils, Moe and Lethal, they pretty much ran the show. But don't mistake them for a keystone. They were more like a grenade pin. Moe was the leverage behind a dozen truces. Nothing happened without his approval. You've got a beef with someone, you save it for Saturdays. It was working, too. Without him, that all blows up. This right now, this is the delay before everything explodes. Did he approve Carver trying to rape Skye? Ash asked. Hambone leaned back against the railing and looked over at Sky. Indirectly, it's all about keeping the peace. You mean getting a peace, Sky replied. Hambone laughed. Yeah, well, that's why they say don't let anyone do you any favors, Blue. There's a big power vacuum now and it's going to get ugly before things get sorted again. Hambone gestured with his cigarette. Like it or not, as of last night, you are the new king of Pirate Island. That's ridiculous, Ash said. I agree, Hambone laughed. But that's where it stands. I have no influence here, Ashley said. You keep telling yourself that, he smiled. There's this guy, Mongo. Him and his crew. They used to be with the lions. But some shit went down and now the lions are gone. So Mongo, he won't take on new colors. He won't side between the dragons or the devils or anyone else. See, Mongo knows if he does, if he joins with anyone else, he's coming down a few pegs. Right now, he's got 50 guys behind him. So everyone just lets him be. The problem is that he can get 50 guys around him. The only reason he can do that is because he's the only guy who ever beat Mo. Until last night, that is. Mo beat Mongo half a dozen times, but one time, Mongo laid him out cold. I bet you money he's the first guy comes looking for you. 
She did kill lethal, Sky pointed out. My point is... Hambone spread his hands. He took a drag and spoke through the smoke. Mo and Lethal were the only thing keeping Mongo from raping half this place. And there's a dozen Mongos. Maybe they didn't actually beat Mo, but they're thinking maybe they could have. Sky, you know I'm right, he said. Sky shook her head and looked away. Hambone counted on his fingers. Slick Rick, Mendoza, Pug, Little Ollie, Big Bad Benson. That's not even mentioning the fact that Mo was the one who bartered our current truce with the pigs. That's just a rumor, Sky asserted. Hey, I don't like the guy, but I know that shit to be true. I had friends go down on that. He put a hard stop to it, and he did it public. You don't know that was why, Sky said. Yeah, well, I guess, technically. But when a man gives a reason for cold stomping four fools to death, I take him at his word. Whether the pigs were selling grammars or not, he thought so. And if that's what he'll do to Tars, he thinks they're slaving little kids... And that guy is all right by me. Hambone took a deep breath. He lowered his voice and continued. Obviously, you guys had different issues. If he'd been trying to rape me, I might have had to reconsider my opinion of the man. But I'm not in that position. Ashley raised her head. As long as I'm the boss here, there won't be any more rapes. There won't be any turning girls into junkie prostitutes and pimping them out. Mo draws the line at selling kids into slavery. I draw the line at enslaving them here. You're not in the business of exploiting kids for profit, are you, Hambone? No. You don't run a whorehouse where girls are raped and then addicted to drugs, do you? No. And what do you care if I kill off your competitors? Ashley asked. Hey, go nuts. All I'm saying is that it's people pimping themselves out is how it looks to me. I don't go for that. I don't deal drugs either. Weapons, contraband, smuggling, protection, escapes. That's our racket. But let me ask you this. People sell themselves. How are you going to solve that? You gonna outlaw sex? People are gonna do what they're gonna do, Ashley answered. But forcing anyone to do something, that I can stop. People are not a commodity to be bought and sold. How they market their own services is none of my business. What are you gonna do? You're a kid. You're a fighter, sure, but you're still just a kid. You're not the cops. You're not God. Not yet, Ashley said. Hambone took the last drag off his cigarette and flicked it over the rail. I'm sorry. I'm being an asshole. Forgive me. I'm hungry. I gotta get some food. You guys want to have breakfast with me? I promise. No more shop talk. I'll be cool. Not another word. Hambone opened the door and held it for them. Ash gestured for Jeff to walk with her. She put an arm over his shoulder. I'm starved, the boy said. Together they went looking for food. Dante and Dr. Malice walked through the medical ward, their hands folded behind their backs. Dante still wore the butterfly bandage across the top of his nose. Is that something I should take a look at? Dr. Malice asked, gesturing to Dante's bandaged beak. Not unless you want one of your own. The surgeon smiled and shook his head. Despite his affable manner, it was clear he wasn't the least bit interested in actually helping Dante. His eyes told the truth. Dr. Malice lived for other people's pain. Marco, Carver, Ronnie, and Mo all occupied beds within a stone's throw of each other, but far too drugged to be aware of much. Dante gestured to the unconscious Mo. How bad is it? Several arteries, ligaments, and tendons were severed. It will take some time for him to heal. So his bare-knuckle career is over? For the immediate future. Scouts and sponsors aren't interested in the distant future. I suppose not. You tell him yet? Dante asked. I gather when he wakes, he will be aware of his predicament. Dante nodded. You know, this could be seen as an opportunity, the doctor offered. Spit it out, Dante snapped. We could augment the joints, replace the cartilage, tendons, and ligaments with more durable materials. Recovery would be a little longer, but that's the only downside. The cost? 300000 give or take. It's best not to skimp on materials. Whatever it costs, start as soon as possible. Of course, Dr. Malice nodded. And Ronnie, what about his eyes? New lenses won't be ready till Thursday, which is unfortunate. The procedure will be more painful once the body has begun healing. Well, then let's make sure it's Thursday and not Friday. Every effort, I assure you. Marco, Dante asked, nodding toward the sleeping gangster. The damage to the hand and wrist were extensive. Once the swelling goes down, we'll pin it. He'll be wearing a brace for some time. 
The right shoulder was dislocated, significant damage to the surrounding tissue. Dante nodded. Your friend with the, uh, twisted his head, referring to Carver's broken neck. Carver? He's in tremendous agony. We can't reset the vertebrae until the muscles relax and they're locked around the displacement, possibly protecting him from further injury to the twisted spinal cord. And? And nothing. There's nothing we can do. Once his body adapts to the condition, it may well become irreversible. We've done everything we can, but it's been almost 48 hours. We were hoping for some improvement, but we're just managing his pain, the doctor explained. Dante scowled. Malice raised his hands. I have a colleague in Austria. He may be interested. I've already called him, but it's a long shot. Please and thank you, doctor. Dante handed him a thick envelope. And thank you, sir. Dr. Malice pocketed the envelope. Dante nodded and left the ward. Chapter 13 The Devil's Sunday Dante entered the Devil's Block, impeccably dressed in a black suit, shirt, and tie. Yama and Frost stared at him. Right, well, let's get to it, he said. What's with the monkey suit? Frost asked. Dante crossed to a locker with a skull and crossbones painted on it. Last night was a big night. We had three wins. Should be something worth picking up. Yo, Dante, I know you want to be all business as usual and shit, but come on now. What are you thinking? Frost inquired. Dante didn't answer or look away from the open weapons locker. Do I have to say it? Frost stepped forward. You ain't got Mo standing behind you no more. Dante looked down at the floor. I never did, Frost. All I ever had was you and Yama. He turned away from the locker and looked at Frost, clearly annoyed. We're still devils, aren't we? Yeah, man, of course. I'm just saying. Frost raised his hands in frustration. Dante looked at the ceiling. You think maybe we aren't up to the task? You think we should just consolidate our power? Lay low? Something like that? No, yes, I mean, look. Who do you want to collect from? Who first? Dante turned back to the task of inspecting the weapons. Usually we hit Polly first, but since little Miss Ashley put him in the infirmary, I think today we should go see Mongo first. Frost turned his back on Dante and rubbed his forehead. Yeah, right, D. He's the one fucking guy. Dante plucked a long metal cane with his skull handle from the locker. The spine shot down to a needle-sharp point. That's right, Frost. He's the one fucking guy. It's time we bury the hatchet. Once word gets around that Mongo is behaving, everyone else is going to fall right in line. You'll see. Yama laughed, but Frost shook his head. If it goes south and it's just us, forget the money. It'll be shift six on all of us. Dead, Frost said flatly. Dante closed the locker. Then we'd better not lose, he asserted. In the hallway, Dante headed in the wrong direction, away from Mongo's cell block. First, however, we have to pay a visit to the warden and convince him to deal with that bitch. Frost tilted his head. You're nuts, man, but I'll come with just to watch. You don't have to do a thing. Just watch, Dante said. The trio entered the district command center and stopped before the reception desk. The duty sergeant ignored them. I need to speak with the captain of the guard, Dante said. The sergeant didn't look up. It's about Donovan, he sighed. The sergeant scowled. Take a seat. Dante, Yama, and Frost sat on the bench anchored to the wall. The sergeant placed a call. Give me the colonel. A few minutes later, the sergeant walked Dante, Yama, and Frost into a training hall. The spacious gymnasium sported open wrestling mats, weapons racks, punching bags, and a sagging boxing ring. Colonel Keller and a dozen of his elite guard were practicing throws and strangleholds. The colonel was of medium height, but wide and powerful, and he was the smallest of the group. They stood on a mat, raising them an additional two inches above the orphans. The practice came to a halt as they approached. Dante held the cane before him, tip resting on the wooden floor, his hands crossed over it as if he were standing in his own personal gym. Captain, Dante queried. Colonel, and who the fuck are you? He asked. I'm Dante, the boy answered. 
And what's with that cane? That's beyond illegal. I took a rather nasty spill yesterday, Dante explained, gesturing to the butterfly bandage on his nose. I was carrying this to assist myself in moving around the facility. I found it in the gardens. I think perhaps a professor left it behind. Rather morbid, don't you think? Dante held up the wicked skull-handled cane, showing it to the guards for a quick moment. Anyhow, I was afraid a child might find it, and since I found myself in need, I took it with me. You'll leave it here, Keller commanded. I'm rather fond of it. I don't think I will. Dante raised a hand before the colonel could interrupt him. But that's not why we're here. I wanted to give you some information about the death of Corporal Donovan. Give, Keller said. It was Ashley Fox. Frost and Yama looked at each other. Ashley Fox? The fighter from last night? Keller snapped. Dante nodded. The one and only. How do you know? The colonel appeared interested. Everyone knows. Do you have any proof? Do I need any? I don't have time for games. Really? Nice outfit, Captain. Dante gestured to the tight wrestling singlet worn by the colonel and his troops. Do you want to lose your teeth? Keller asked. You want to touch my what? Dante laughed. The guards seethed with anger, but Keller held them back. Dante stepped forward, addressing all of them. Fuckheads, I make more in a week than you do all year. Whatever you do to me, I'll just get upgraded and be more dangerous than before. Can they bring you back from the dead? Keller inquired. You'll have to kill me first, like little Miss Ashley did Donovan. Without proof, that's worthless. Dante smiled. First off, you do the proof. That's your job, you shit. The fact is, she killed Donovan. Yesterday, she beat Modred into the ground and killed Leland. All live stream during an illegal pit fight. There's plenty of proof. Pick a fucking crime. Perception is more important than proof. She's not going to fade away quietly. You saw what she did to Lethal. I thought it looked premeditated. Keller narrowed his eyes and took another look at the teen. Dante stood his ground. No longer laughing or smiling, just glaring at the guards. He straightened, and somehow, the courageous boy seemed to be standing taller than any of them. He waited a moment and finally rolled his eyes. Dante turned and slowly walked to the door. His hands folded behind his back. The needle cane pointed directly at them like a sharp metal tail. He opened the door with his foot and exited the gym, followed by Yama and Frost, who both shot looks of contempt at the guards for their cowardice and hesitation. Keller alone smiled. Find his record and make him 11 years old. He's never getting out of here. The guards cackled and dove back to their judo practice. Dante marched through the district taller than ever before, the silver needle rising from behind his back. Soon he, Yama, and Frost entered the north wheel, Mongo's block. Only four circular blocks could be found in the bolt. Three stories of catwalked cells opened onto a central common area, decked out with couches, video screens, and workout equipment. The resident inmates lounged about, watching TV or playing video games. Mongo and his buddies sat atop a raised platform. When they spotted Dante, everyone stopped whatever they were doing. Mongo saw Dante and jumped up. Well, well, well. All dressed up and no one to blow, huh, cocksucker? Can we just do this this one time without screwing around? Dante replied. The cell denizens were shocked by Dante's scorn. Neither they nor Mongo moved. Who's screwing around, buddy? Mongo asked in a serious tone. Good. So then give us the percentage and we'll be on our way. Mongo laughed. You think today's the day you get by? With his smile to Yama and Frost, Dante waited for Mongo to talk, but whenever he did, Dante spoke too, purposefully and deliberately driving Mongo mad. That's not this what is bullshit, day is, Mongo. Today I have is other not pickups your day. to make. Today Stop is screwing this around and let's get moving here. Today you I don't, don't have make time it. for this bullshit, you ignorant monkey, Dante blasted in, laughing. Today's a bad day for you, my friend, Mongo yelled furious. Dante moved to speak but then yielded the floor. I'll give you one chance to improve your fortunes. Get out right now. Get out. This is your one chance. I'm being merciful here. He huffed and puffed. Dante remained calm, cool, and collected. He planted the cane on the ground between them. His hands folded over the skull. 
As much as I'd like to set business aside in recognition of our loss, I cannot. The business has to go on, or else we'll have anarchy. Do you understand? I understand. I'm looking at this as an opportunity. Why don't we do something about patching things up? Maybe we can even forgive some of your debt. Mongo tilted his head to the side. You know, if you and your boys agree to swear in his devils. That did it. Dante hit Mongo's soft spot. He pressed the momentary advantage. If you don't stay on schedule, I'll have to consider alternative collection measures. Mongo came out from around the table, moving carefully but furious. Like what, motherfucker? Dante dragged his words out, speaking slowly, making Mongo wait, taunting him. Like... Maybe selling your markers to more aggressive loan recovery establishments? Dante smiled. You're supposed to get out of here in what, six months? This kind of thing can follow you much longer than that. Mongo took a step closer, but they were still a good distance apart. How about this, bitch? You forgive all my debt, and I let you walk out of here with no blood leaking out of your corner. Mongo was huge. Not quite as big as Mo, but he towered over Dante. His soldiers laughed. Dante stepped forward, the cane held low, behind his back. The mood instantly got much more serious. How long have you been here, Mongo? Something like three or four years now? You're a runaway, right? I fucking hate runaways. I bet you were the source of all your mama's problems, weren't you? I bet you had a good home and you, being the shitbag that you are... You went and fucked it all up, didn't you? Drove your parents apart. Drove your mom nuts. Yeah, you did it. I know you did. Fuck you, Dante. You don't know shit, Mongo screamed. Dante stood his ground. I know I was born here. I've been here all my life. What do I have to lose? Everyone stayed quiet, watching, shocked. Usually the kids would cheer on a good old-fashioned fight. But the physical conflicts of the last few days had taken a more permanent turn. Who busted up your hoover? Mongo asked. Dante flashed a glare at him but didn't reply. I'm guessing it was the bitch then, wasn't it? Got you too, huh? Probably been telling people you fell. Mongo's crew laughed riotously. Dante waited for a lull before speaking. They say the best fighters know the outcome of a fight before it starts. Do you believe that, Mongo? You think you can beat me? Is that what you're saying, Dante? Mongo mocked the use of his proper name. If you don't pay, you're gonna find out, Dante answered. Well, fucking bitch, I'm down. Let's get it on. Mongo rolled his shoulders and raised his fists. Let's. Dante raised the cane, offering it to Frost. Oh, wait. Keep it. Mongo pointed to the heavy snake of iron links hanging on a nearby wall. Give me those chains. One of his soldiers pulled the long chain from the hook and handed it to Mongo. He wrapped one end around his left fist and swung the other in lazy circles. Let's see what you got, bitch! After a couple revolutions of linked metal, Mongo stepped forward, attacking, the chain already hissing with its wound-up momentum. Dante sidestepped the clumsy maneuver and buried the cane in the center of Mongo's chest. Eighteen inches of bloody chrome penetrated into the open air on the other side of his back. Mongo dropped the chain and fell to his knees. Dante planted a foot on his chest and pushed the dead boy from the silver piece of steel. Mongo's eyes rolled up as he collapsed to his side. Blood spewing from his mouth and chest, the bright crimson pouring onto the floor. Mongo's soldiers were stunned. Dante turned to them. Any of you want jobs? The room was quiet. Dante swung the excess blood from the cane and wiped it across dead Mongo's shoulder. Go tell the other gangs what happened here. I want all payments delivered to my block by tomorrow at noon. I'm offering one day of amnesty in remembrance of lethal. Dante, Yama, and Frost walked to the doorway. Dante paused. One more thing. This is now a devil's block. If you ain't swearing black, you ain't sleeping here. Dante pointed at a big, red-headed guy. Red, who's the toughest guy here after Mongo? Me, he answered without hesitation. How old are you? Dante asked. Fifteen, he answered. You're the new boss until someone kicks your ass. You send me an earnings report and your percentage every week. Starting next week, you pay ten percent. Got it? 
Dante explained. Ten percent? Mongo was paying fifteen. Mongo was paying eighteen. And that's what I expect tomorrow. But you've got a clean slate. Remember, taxes never go down. They only go up. And you've heard what they say about death and taxes.